Hello, souls and demons, and welcome back. Today's story is part two of I Found My Likeness in a Torture Game, written by Cecily 1987. If you missed part one, a link will be in the description. And with that, sit back, grip your seats, and enjoy the show. I need the newest update from your game, I told Harold of the Void over the chat he had set up for us. This is already a big risk I'm taking to help you, Miss J. Are you certain you can't get what you need from the prototype version I've already sent you? I've combed through all the levels in the game. I've seen every twisted ending, every branching choice. I've even hacked the game and opened up the config. I know opening the command console wasn't hacking, but my nephew had advised me to play dumb to get more information out of the shady developer. Yes, I did tell my nephew. Let's call him Daniel for now. I was alone and needed somebody in my circle to help me. I know, however, unlikely. Daniel could have been part of the creation of the torture game. Even though Herald of the Void reluctantly told me this game's price range goes between $30,000 to $80,000 when completed. Daniel didn't have a job. He mined Bitcoin. Received measly Twitch donations from live streaming. And had to walk the family dogs for a weekly allowance. But I tested him none the same. A true litmus test that only the best actors in my field could pass to fool me. I brought Daniel over to show him the prototype game on my computer. When he saw the first screen, and upon seeing the kill room, he turned pale and refused to play. I had to be sure of his intentions. So I took over the mouse and keyboard to show him some of the worst features I had discovered. Explicit warning, guys. It gets pretty bad from here in. My extremely detailed character model was strapped to a metal table, stripped naked, and begging for mercy. Daniel, red with embarrassment, begged me for mercy too. He was wondering why I was making him look at a virtual model of me naked. I felt terrible, but I had to be sure he was safe. I used my killer to cut out my body double's tongue, carving a wicked line from the middle of my bottom lip, all the way to the private region. Daniel vomited into the wastebasket under the computer desk. I felt like a horrible aunt, but I also felt happy it wasn't him. He even stopped, caught his breath, thought some more about what I showed him, and threw up again. If he was faking then he could give me lessons in method acting. I explained to Daniel that I needed his help. I really didn't want him involved at all. I was just clearing him of suspicion and selfishly needed someone to talk to. But now that I had fake recruited him, I had to give him a task that wouldn't put him in any danger. I had him lurk the fan sites to see if anybody stood out as a possible threat. I also had him catalog any evidence we came across to give to the police in case things turned sour and something happened to me. Finally, I forbid him from looking into the enigmatic Herald of the Void. Even though Harold seemed to be trying to help me, I had a feeling he was dangerous and he would be on the lookout for somebody trying to suss him out if he really was sticking his neck out for me. You all still may be mad at me for committing a form of war crime on my poor nephew by making him experience my virtual vivisection. And I totally understand anyone hating me. I hate myself a little too. Since becoming famous, I have been betrayed by the people closest to me, all looking to exploit me or fetishize me. First was my ex-husband, then my first agent and even a long-time best friend. I figured if my nephew wasn't the mastermind of this evil plan, he could still be being manipulated by someone to do their evil bidding. As gross as it feels to say, 
Daniel hadn't been my biggest fan until he hit puberty. Once he told his classmates he was related to me, they used the information to bully him relentlessly. I think the kid played young Anakin, but on a slightly smaller scale. He also found out he was adopted around the same time. Please don't make me go into why that logic factors in a twisted way. I like to think I secretly knew Daniel was innocent. That's why I tested him so quickly, but I'd be lying. Truth is, I was pretty jaded, but karma could sort me out later if it needed to later. Schedule an impromptu fan meetup came the suggestion from Herald of the Void. There are three smaller cons going on in your area in the next two weeks. Drop in and surprise your fans at the first, then let me know if you're hitting up the next two. How does that make sense? I'm supposed to be laying low or trying to figure out what mystery man is trying to kill me. How does showing up in public with little planning help me stay safe? There was a moment on the other side of the screen as Harold typed away furiously at his rebuttal. But I already knew what his logic might be. Again, I was playing the part of the helpless blonde, now with matching dyed hair and extensions. I got a new list of voice lines the client once implemented into the game. Really strange stuff. I told him the laptop I was using to generate all your deepfake voices was on the fritz and was being repaired. I made up a lie about needing actual dialogue from you in order to create a baseline, so I could teach a new AI on my new computer. I told him, the closer to the actual requested voice line, the better. And it would take weeks before I could patch it into the game if I didn't get them. I didn't like the prospect of meeting the guy that fetishizes murdering me. But I was running out of leads. And I had just found the bondage rope in my backyard four days ago. He was near, and getting bolder and bolder. It felt like there was a ticking clock, counting down to when I ended up in the IRL kill room. I've already added the text for the audio into the game. He already wants a lot of his lines imported. Probably so he can read it and get off to it. Maybe you can run through the game again. Maybe get clues on his identity without scheduling a meet and greet with your fans. Harold added quickly. I angrily signed off. Both prospects seemed like shit to me. But only one had me in danger of real physical harm. Not just mental. So I reluctantly booted up the torture game. Grimaced again at the horrid picture of the crucified crow man experienced my screaming face, and finally selected Kill Room. There I was once again, transported into a dark medical room, and once again my virtual double was tied down to a medical gurney of some sort. To not get confused, we will call my virtual body double VBD from now on. Like she had done every time, VBD began begging me to let her go. I had heard it all before, and I'd explored all of the dialogue options with VBD from this point in the game. I quickly reached out to turn my wireless speaker's volume all the way down. VBD's whiny voice cut out of existence. It had become almost second nature to immediately turn off the nauseating sound of me begging for my life. I had already put myself through the real torture of replaying the kill room over and over, scarring my mind by scouring every dialogue line and torture option. It always ended with the player making it clear there was no hope of escape, and torture continued until VBD died. I know I'm going to have to go to my shrink twice a week for the next couple of decades to deal with what I have done to my poor VBD. I've used pliers for fingernails, teeth, and toes. A blowtorch to cauterize bleeding wounds, so the torture session could continue longer. But that caused VBD to faint. So I would have to reload the game or actually wait a real hour for VBD to wake up again. 
or I could use a shot of adrenaline to wake her up, even though too much will cause her heart to explode. I could use hooks and razor wire to string up VBD like it was Hellraiser. But I might need to break VBD's legs, or cut her Achilles tendon so she doesn't try to run off while you strung her up in any position you wanted. I could remove the skin off of any part of VBD's body, either to stitch it back on, or cook it up on a hot plate to force her to eat it. I blew chunks after discovering that. And if the begging and screaming got too annoying, I could cut out VBD's tongue or crush her windpipe. That's just a short list of things available to perform on the current build of the game. It was very detailed, very intricate, and very disturbing. It was obvious this was part of the game the mysterious client wanted to spend most of his time on. Something else was very strange to me. During all of this depravity, there was a distinct lack of sexual content. And this game did everything to the 10th degree, but no sex, just torture. Harold even told me that he had many in-game assets to easily make the game more perverse, but the client never requested any of it to be implemented into the current build of the game. It was as if the client just got off on the torture or really hated me. In-game, I cycled quickly through dialogue options. VBD stared at me from the table, pleading for her life and I choose at random what taunt or threat I replied to her with. But then a new line of dialogue caught my eye. Say my name again. Say what you said the last time we met. The dialogue read, indicating the killer was demanding this of VBD. This was new, and now I was back, thoroughly invested in what was going on on my screen in front of me. This time say because I am the most important thing in your life. Say because you need me to show mercy. The awful text read. Because I am God to you at this very moment. Don't say it like last time, when you were paid to perform. Say it like your life depends on it. What? Met before? Have I met my virtual killer already? What did he want me to say? I noticed VBD wasn't forthcoming with the information I wanted. As weird as it felt to do, I selected the blowtorch and held the blue flame above BVD's exposed midriff. VBD let out one of her repeatedly used screams of fright, and dialogue popped up on the screen. Save me, Kylo. I love you. Read the text at the bottom of the screen without audio. Kylo. He goes by Kylo? I tried to think if I knew anybody with that name. It sounded like a code name. Isn't that military code or something, or maybe a druggy thing? This gave me three new options. Continue torture. Kill her. Let her go. Let me go? He would let me live? This was crazy. VBD never survived the game. I clicked to let her go and waited. The screen turned black and a message displayed. Sequence not available in current build. I was amazed and highly suspicious. The asshole would let me live, even after prying my fingernails off. I just had to tell him I loved him. He said we had met before. He didn't have audio for his new dialogue yet. Andy had audio no matter how shoddy it sounded for everything in the game. He plans on meeting me, I said out loud to nobody, like I was in a movie for dramatic effect. He needs the new dialogue. He needs to hear me say I love him. Could I turn this on him? Could I go looking for him instead? Or was it a trap? I still didn't trust Harold of the Void. He could still be taking orders from the stalker. It could be bait to get me out of the house and make me vulnerable. I sat for a good minute thinking, weighing the pros and cons. 
Even if it was a trap, I was tired of sitting here playing this damn game. How do the writers say it? I had no agency. I was a passive, dull character, just reacting to the world around me. I was the damsel in distress. I snatched up my phone and speed dialed a number. Yes, ma'am, answered Mel, my security guy stationed in his vehicle outside. Good morning, Mel. I need you to bring on another security guy, someone that you trust, just for a few weeks. I can do, replied Mel's gruff voice. Can I ask the reason? I'm going to drop in on a couple of conventions in the area. You know, get some fan reactions. Do some guerrilla marketing for my new movie. I don't know anything about being a movie star, Miss J. Mel laughed. I'll leave the hard stuff to you, while I just follow you around. But I can get you a good guy. We serve together. Awesome, I said back with fake excitement. I was putting my acting skills to work, so nobody suspected how paranoid and scared I was. This nightmare had to stop. I was tired of huddling scared over a computer, waiting for a new update. I had to take my agency back. I had to have drive. I was on the hunt now. I was going to meet this sicko I was going to love.